Welcome Seymour Pro, Captain Mutt Mike D of Miami. Really good to have you here today. And uh, gonna learn some more about what you offer as a guide and some daytime sword fishing techniques in Florida. Looking so, forward to it, thank you for having me here. Absolutely, you're, and you're known for offering guided saltwater fishing from snapper to swords off Miami. How did you get into that business? Well, you know, I spent my a lifetime fishing. You know, I worked with every charter boat captain in Miami, you know, from Jimmy David to Bouncer Smith, everywhere in between. Um, you know, and uh, it just, it was unfulfilling for me, you know, working for other captains. Uh, it just got to a point where I want, kind of wanted to go out on my own and branch off and, and start my own business. Unfortunately, you know, the cars weren't in it for me to, to own my own boat. So I kind of found a niche where I would go on other people's boats and teach them how to use you know, their boat, what they had, their tackle to target the species that they didn't necessarily know how to catch or wanted to learn how to catch. You know, so that kind of caught on pretty quick a couple of years ago when I started the business model. And um, so far, so good. I, I, you know, I enjoy it, running my own business. It's great. I, you know, I love fishing and I, and I love the people that I get to fish with. And no doubt. Um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, and you, you've had a ton of success out there. So how long have you been fishing personally? Well, longer than I can remember. Um, my father got me started at probably four or five years old. He has pictures of me. Again, I don't remember these days. Uh, my father was a, was a charter boat mate at the Castaways dock, and he loved fishing. So he got me started again at, at a very young age, pretty much just after I could walk. Uh, started catching bluegills in Snake Creek and worked our way up to some bass and some snook in the freshwater canals. And then when I got to be about six or seven years old, he started taking me offshore. Um, the rest is history. You know, I'm 38 years old today. Uh, it's been a passion for my entire life. Uh, it only gets more passionate for me as I go. It's kind of like a disease. No matter how much I fish, I want to fish more. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. You know, I've been you know, fishing for, I would say, 32 years. Solid, probably more than 75 trips a year, at least. Uh, up to anywhere from 300 trips a year. Gotta love it, man. And, you know, obviously you've developed an incredible skill set just throughout the years and a variety of environments. And then that transitioned into becoming a guide. So what do you offer as a guide and how does that really work? Well, I offer obviously all of my experience, um, all of my know-how regarding species that my particular customer wants to target. Uh, a lot of my customers these days are uh, wanting to target swordfish. You know, it's a growing fishery. Uh, there's nothing else you could fish for off of Miami where you have an opportunity to catch a thousand pound fish. Um, so that's something I've been doing a lot of. Now, when it comes to what I offer, besides my knowledge and everything else, when I come on your boat, I bring everything that's necessary for a day's trip. Um, the electric reel, the bait, harpoon, um, the bass, the dart basket, the lead, the life, the hooks, the terminal tackle, everything that's needed. Uh, most importantly, my uh, portable sim ride unit and my high resolution Seymour chip. Um, this gives me a major advantage when I'm fishing. I'm able to eliminate the water that does not hold the swordfish. And as we all know, 80% of the water has zero fish in it. It's 20% that has the 80% of the fish in it. And my Seymour map allows me to dial that in and figure out exactly where they live. So that's a major advantage. But the only thing that my customers need to bring is their boat, a full tank of gas, a smile, and a bunch of gas. And that's about it super easy and obviously they come across an experience where they can learn a ton start to target something that they haven't caught before and we've seen some amazing catches come from your trips like a 65 pound black grouper and some monster swords what would you say is your most memorable catch well that's a hard one uh considering i've had a lot of them but there's definitely one that stands out over the rest um it's the catch that happened in june of 2019 not too long ago, um, we were out sword fishing. I had a particular client out there. This was probably the third or fourth time we had been out there. And we were fishing for about three or four hours. Hadn't had much luck. And I started thinking about the bluefins that had been in the area. There had been a couple bluefins caught a week before. Um, and actually the day before that particular day that we were out there fishing. So I started thinking about a bluefin tuna. And I don't normally do this because it's outlandish to think that you're going to actually ask for a bluefin tuna bite while you're sword fishing off Miami and get it. But I ended up looking up at this guy jokingly and saying, come on, at least give me a tuna if you're not going to give me a swordfish. And I kid you not, I have witnesses about 15 seconds later, 
the rod loaded up, the drag starts peeling off the reel, fish starts head shaking, slacks us off, comes tight, slacks us off, and within about 15 or 20 seconds, I looked at my clients and I said, you're not going to believe this, but we've got a bluefin tuna off. And they looked at me like, how, how do you know that? You've been fighting this fish for 10 seconds. And I explained to them that I've caught over 350 swordfish, and I've caught everything else that swims out here, except for a bluefin tuna. And I've never had a fish fight the way that fish was fighting. Three and a half hours later, a 94-inch bluefin tuna was at the side of the boat. Unfortunately, the fish had died throughout the fight, but it was still an awesome catch and probably my most memorable. That's, that's absolutely incredible. I mean, something like that doesn't happen every day. And of course, to share that with someone else, I mean, that story is just going to live, live on forever. The thing that really intrigues me about your business is, of course, you bring the setup, you know, you make it nice and easy for everyone that's on that boat. You can teach them something new. So I really want to dial in on, you know, how you target daytime swordfish in specific. And we'll go through some must-haves um, when swordfishing. So that being said, what are just some absolute must-haves to daytime swordfish in South Florida? Well, first and foremost is good bait that doesn't spin. Um, that's number one. Without that, everything else between the bait and the rod doesn't matter. Um, so most important thing should be your bait. Should be doesn't have to be fresh, but you know because they aren't too picky. I've come to find out, but it does have to swim straight. It does have to be durable. Um, because if they beat it up, the moment it doesn't look like it's swimming right, they're going to leave it alone. I mean, they, they did get to be what they are for a reason. They're not completely stupid, but um, they are pretty aggressive, and they're not too picky. So that's the most important thing. Obviously, from there, the important things are good hooks, crimps, um, good swivels, skirts. You're going to have to have some light, some small rubber bands, wind-on leaders. You're going to have to have a couple long line clips. If you're doing it, I'm not with you. You're going to have to have all this stuff. You're going to have to have lead. And then working back, must have is some fresh braid. Uh, summertime, I like to fish 65 because the current just absolutely rips. Um, but once you get into the winter months and the current slows down, 80 braid is okay. And then, you know, you need a good, a good rod, um, something that's going to show you the bite pretty decent. And you also need a, a decent electric reel. Um, if you want a hand crank, you'll have to use like a, a, a real assist with a drill or something along those lines. And in that case, you'll need a really good um, lever drag reel, Shimano Tiagra, Kuma Makaira, Ali Techno, something along those lines. But those Absolutely. are definite must-haves. And a Seymour chip would be nice too. Yeah, that, that little secret sauce on top. So, Oh, yeah. And there's a variety of baits that are out there, and there's always an ongoing discussion if One's better than another. People go from eel, bonita, you know, mahi, squid. What's your personal preference? My personal preference would have to be the freshwater eel. Um, it's a bait that's very durable, if rigged properly, of course. Uh, very durable. I've caught up to five fish on one bait before. Um, so that's one that I would recommend for beginners. I like to use it with my customers because I want to get them used to baits that work. And, and you know, why put down something that's going to be a challenge where you can put down a bait that can get beat up to crap and the fish is still going to eat it so my preference right. is the eel now i love bonita bellies i love my swimmers which other people call tacos um, dolphin bellies are excellent like i said the most important thing is just the fact that it swims straight and it and it doesn't fall apart when the swordfish whacks it if, if you got those two factors together you're, you're doing pretty good you're ahead of the game you made a really good point when you said that you've caught multiple swords on one bait. And it seems like a lot of people have this mis misconception that they need to bring multiple baits with them. And that's not the reality. So when you're going out, how many baits do you bring? Oh, it depends uh, if, if I'm fishing multiple rods or, or the case, but I'll typically try to bring a bait for every drift I anticipate making. Um, let's say I've got a client that wants to go out there. I know he's hardcore. He wants to go from sun up to sundown. And he wants to fish for our limit of swordfish. He doesn't care. We're fishing all day. I'll probably bring, you know, 10 to 12 baits. Um, now, if I've got a client that's like, hey, listen, I want to go for a half day. We're going to go make three or four drifts. If we get one, we get one. If we don't, we don't. Then that's what I'll do. I'll bring about three or four baits. So it all depends. But, you know, you definitely want to bring more than you think you're going to use because once you're out there, 
it's kind of hard to go to the freezer and pull one out. You know what I mean? If you don't have it with you, you're screwed. So I like to live by the, by the saying better to have and not need than to need and not have. Absolutely. And, it, and it's always about attention to detail, right? When it comes down to that bait. And one thing that I'd really like you to kind of talk about here is that when you put that hardware together, when you're actually rigging that bait, is there any sort of technique that you would tell a beginner not to do? Oh, well, that's not necessarily not to do. What I would tell them is things to do. Like the most important thing is making sure that that eye of the hook is secure to that portion of the bait where they're attaching it. Because not only do you want your bait to stay together, but you don't want the swordfish to be able to pull the bait down the shank of the hook, if you, if you understand what I'm saying, for two reasons. One, it'll make the bait not swim naturally, and he won't bite it anymore. Two, if you've got him on the line and he's hooked, and that bait slides down into the corner of the, of the hook, into the hook shank, it works just like a de-hooker, and it'll unhook the fish. So the most important factor when rigging that bait is making sure that where that bait is connected to the eye of the hook is very solid because that's your main connection. You don't want it to move from there. Uh, from that point on, you just want to make sure it's sewn up again so that it can beat it up and not tear it apart. And the most important thing, again, just making sure that that bait cannot get pulled back into the shank of the hook. Sure. And now that we've really found that ideal bait, we know that what we're going to run with out there at the end of the day, it also comes down to structure and depth and what you're working for during those uh, daytime swords. So when you're looking at your Seymour chart and you're planning out your day, how are you utilizing that chart to pick those spots for your drift? Well, it depends where I'm going to be fishing. So if I'm fishing off Miami, I'm going to look anywhere from, you know, 10 miles south to about 10 miles north. If I'm fishing out of government or Almorada or whatever, I'm going to be doing the same thing. I'm going to be looking at a certain stretch of water. Now, I'm going to pick my plan A, which is where I'm going to start first. Typically, that'll be somewhere between, you know, 1,600 and 1,700 feet of water, which is your normal good depth to target a swordfish, and I'm going to make that drift. If I go through my normal areas that I know whole fish, one or two drifts, and I don't get a bite, then what I'm going to maybe possibly do is either move inside or move outside, just kind of based on what my gut's telling me. Um, now, something I say inside, I'll move into as little as 1,450 or 1,500 feet of water. And when I say outside, I'm talking out to anywhere 2,100 feet, 2,200 feet. So when I use my Seymour chart, I'll locate the chart, the swordfish grounds, and you can see clearly with the color shading where the drop-offs are. So what I try to find is when it drops off, I don't necessarily want to fish the drop off. It's kind of sticky. I've noticed I get some shark bites in there. And you do catch some swords, don't get me wrong, but it's not my favorite place to fish. What I like to find off the edge of the drop, about 1650, 1700, 1750, once you get from a little north of Hall over up the coast past Boca, is, you know, some pretty decent little humps in, inside of little valleys. And that's my kind of favorite areas to target a sword. I've fished some of the giant hills and these huge deep holes. And you would think this has got to be the spot that holds the fish. But what I found over once I received that chart and I started eliminating water is those giant pieces of structure. Yes, granted, they'll hold fish from time to time. There's no fences out there. Those fish go where they want. But the pieces of water that have worked best for me, if you can find a little valley just after a drop off or in between, you know, hills and drop-offs that runs north and south up the coast, and there's some little areas of life on the bottom and some little hills and valleys in there, you're in a good spot. Obviously, you get out to the spot. There's there's a lot that's to be done. I mean, it's just the beginning, and you've already found that spot on your Seymour chart, and you know how you're going to position your drift. Walk us through that process of when you're letting out your line and what that looks like. Okay. Well, the, the biggest factor when you're letting out the line is, a lot of people would think, oh, I need to drive into the current. That's going to keep me from tangling when it's the exact opposite. The simple fact is the most efficient and fastest way to drop a sword bait in the daytime is to slowly motor away from the bait as you're driving north, put the bait in the water, make sure it's not spinning first and foremost. Make sure your lights are secure where they need to be. Then as you get to the lead, as you throw the lead in the water, you speed up the boat to about anywhere at personal preference. I like about 9, 10 miles an hour. Now, I'll drive due north at about 9, 10 miles an hour, and I'll let about 1,000 feet of line off the reel. Once I've let about 1,000 feet or half of the line off the reel, 
I'll spin the boat in a tight circle and just start bumping the boat to the south, bucking the tide. Now, depending on how strong the tide is, is going to depend on how much I have to fight the tide. But I typically, when I'm bucking the tide to the south, I like to be going somewhere between one and a half and two miles an hour to the north. So I will adjust depending on, you know, the current on that particular day. So it, it's pretty easy. The deployment is pretty easy. You slowly get the bait out, attach the lead. Once you get the lead over the side, you speed up. You get about half of the line out, spin the boat around, start bucking the current. And as you get more and more line out, you apply a little bit of pressure as you're getting close to the bottom. It'll take some of the slack and some of the belly out of the line. And usually by about the time you're getting straight up and down, is when your lead hits the bottom. Then you just reel it up 150 feet, and you're fishing. And what's your preference here on your your leader? How much how much are you working with there? And then what type of braid are you using? Uh, I use Memoy High Catch. Uh, it's kind of supple. Um, I like it. It's worked well for me. And I use a 250 pound test, and I like to use about a 150 foot section of that. And that's what works very well for me. I mean, some people like 100 feet. Some people like 200 feet. Um, I think it's that 150-foot length is, is good enough length, but still allows me to see the bite decent because I've, I've fished 250-foot leaders before, and it's, it's a lot more difficult to see the bite sometimes. So, you know, that's what's worked for me over the years. Uh, and, again, a lot of that's personal preference. I've seen guys drop basically a chicken rig down there and catch them just out of sheer luck. Um, but day in and day out, 150 foot is what I would recommend your to your average person doing it. Right, and when you're looking at that, and you're you need that attention to detail to see when that strike happens, right? Everyone's looking at it, they oh, see a consistent I, rhythm. I mean, what what is the the main thing to look for and to identify to say, hey, you know, we're hooked up? Well, there's usually three things that'll happen. Um, what happens probably 75% of the time, and the majority of the time is the, the rod will be loaded up, you know, the lead on there, the boat will be rocking, doing its thing. You'll see a normal, a normal flow, the way the rod moves up and down. In the middle of all that, you'll see a little tiny little tap. This looks like somebody came by and flicked the line with their finger. And that could be a 50 pound swordfish, could be a thousand pound swordfish. So that's what happens most of the time. You'll just see in the middle of everything, you'll just see a tiny tap. Now what you want to do when that happens, move the bait a little bit. That'll entice the swordfish, come back and hit it again. And you want to keep doing that until you get tight. Move it 20 feet, move it 20 feet, drop it back. Move it, move it, drop it back. Just keep it moving until the swordfish either eats the bait and comes tight or goes away. So another thing that will happen a lot is the rod will just go slack. You'll be washing the rod tip, and all of a sudden it will kind of stop bouncing, and the rod will just look like it's going slack. A lot of people will think, oh, what happened? We got cut off. We lost the lead. What's going on? No. What's happening is the fish either swam up and got tangled up in the leader and got foul hooked, or it just swallowed the bait and now it's swimming up towards the surface. So that's another thing that'll happen. And the third thing that happens, which happens probably the least of the amount of time, for me anyway, the luck of the draw, but it happens the least amount for me, is the rod will just load up like you're hanging bottom. All of a sudden you'll be watching the rod tip and it'll start to get heavy and heavy and heavy and heavy and it'll just load up. Now I like that bite because most of the time it baits down the hatch, but it doesn't happen often. So the thing you really want to be looking for the thing that's the least obvious is the tap. The other two factors, when it goes slack or when it loads up, those are obvious. Anybody can notice those fights. But the most important one is that little tap, that initial tap, because if you don't see that and you don't move the bait, there's a good chance that that fish is going to leave that bait alone and go find something else. That's right. When it loads up, that, that's a feeling that everyone loves. And it's uh, it's really just the beginning there. So, I mean, once that happens, what, what happens next? How do you really not lose that fish? What happens next when the rod starts to load up? So for me, and again, everybody has a personal preference. What I found works for me is I like to hit the fish hard. You know, I like to make sure that I've either got a good hook set or I've torn it out of a soft spot immediately. I don't really want to spend too long if I don't have to fighting a fish that the hook's going to come out of. So what I'll do is when the rod starts to load up and I know that I'm there and I'm tight, you stop in the reel. And I do this, I'll put usually, depending on how rough it is and whether I'm using 65 or 80 pound braid, I'll usually put somewhere between 25 and 30 pounds of drag on the strike. And when the rod starts to load up, I'll either put the boat in neutral if there's a lot of current and let the current pull me to the north. So I take all the slack out of that, of that line and really hook that fish good. Or if there's very little current, 
I'll back up to the north until I'm very tight on that fish. And he stopped that drag at 25, 30 pounds, and I know he's there. At that point, I'll start idling back to the south, and I'll usually back off somewhere between 15 and 18 pounds of drag. Again, depending on how rough it is, I'm using 65 or 80 pound braid, those factors, whether I think I've got them foul hooked. But usually for me, hook set, 25, 30 pounds of drag, I'll fight the fish on about 15 to 18 until I kind of see what's going on. The big fish, the small fish, if I can see where it's hooked, then I'll adjust accordingly. I might need to go to a lighter drag, or I might need to just push the drag up and fight the fish if you've got it down the hatch. So a lot of factors involved. Sure, and obviously you get to that next point, you know, you're breaking off the lead, keeping tight out there, and then you're really focused on getting that fish into the boat there. Um, what are some fine details or some points from that movement uh, moving forward that you think are absolutely key to getting that fish on the boat? Most important thing is don't run the line over. You know, uh, Ralph Delph, I remember a long time ago, one of the greatest charter boat captains of all time, said if you're not connected to the fish, you can't catch it. And it stuck with me for a very long time. So the most important thing is just don't drive over the line. Be patient, keep the fish away from the motor, and, and fight the fish. Um, some fish are going to be uh, very aggressive, and they're going to charge the boat. Usually happens when they're foul hooked or when they're lassoed or something, when the line's wrapped around them. They'll charge the boat a lot, so you have to be ready for that. But again, it's just like any other fish. Sometimes you can't put too much pressure on them because it's not going to do you any good. You just have to fight the fish and tire them out. Now, one of the, uh, the opportunities that will arise sometimes, especially with bigger fish, is they'll come up on the surface, and early on in the fight, they'll give you an opportunity to get a dart in them. So when that happens, you know, you want to try and get over and get a dart in them. Now, this becomes tricky because you can run the line over. So, again, just the most important thing, keeping steady pressure and just not running that line over and being patient. Your opportunities will come. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I think that there's there's so much technique when it comes down to daytime swords. And there's also a lot of personal preference that comes in and, and feel based on that scenario. So really uh, appreciate all the insight that goes into it. And once you bring that fish on the boat, people are always happy. I know that you've uh, made a lot of dreams happen. And that being said, you know, we want to present the opportunity to give away one of your trips for free um, to any customer that wants to sign up for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up an online form for individuals to enter the contest. They can enter just their basic information there. And then they can also come see you at the Miami Boat Show and visit you on Saturday and get to know you a little bit more and just talk about see more mapping and sword fishing or fishing in general. And then at the end of the month, we're going to uh, do that giveaway and set you up with a free trip out there uh, right with uh, Captain Mutt and Mike D. Really excited about that. So make sure to join I am us. I too. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so make sure to join us at the show. And, of course, uh, there's there's always more to learn. And if you have any questions, you could always reach out to them. I think you're always, it seems like Instagram, you're always lighting it up. There's a ton of great content going on over there. So, you know, never be too shy to uh, reach out to the guide and, you know, the man himself, he'll he'll definitely get it done. Thanks so much for being here today and looking forward to meeting with you again at uh, the Miami show. And of course, this giveaway coming up. Yeah, man, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to being there. And like you said, you know, please, if, if anybody has any questions regarding anything fishing, um, I love to talk fishing. I will talk shop all day long and I do not mind um, giving, you know, good information to, to customers. Um, or to potential customers or just to other fishermen. I don't mind sharing information. I also learn from them as well. So don't hold back. You know, I love talking to you guys. I would love for everybody to come see me at the boat show. Bring all your questions, your notepad. Um, let's look at Seymour. I'll show you how I use that to do all kinds of different types of fishing. And uh, let's have a good time. And most importantly, let's just get out there and catch some fish. Well, there you have it. Looking forward to it. And again, thanks so much. See you at Miami. Likewise, looking forward to it as well. Thank you.